Ace Podcast. Thank you for seeing me today, Doctor. Of course. I see you're having some issues. Yeah, it all started when I ran out of podcasts to listen to. I felt anxious, alone, and even scared. It happens all too often. Podcast deficiency disorder. It can be a serious struggle with no answer in sight. Until now. Introducing Nerdy Words from Geek Productions. Through intense peer review studies, the Nerdy Words team have developed the perfect formula to finally defeat all symptoms of PDD. With just one episode a week, your feelings of helplessness through lack of podcast satisfaction will be a thing of the past. With heavy doses of off-the-cuff, barely put-together thoughts about all things nerdy and beyond, your PDD will melt away. Side effects include frustration at hosts' inability to accurately quote facts, annoyance at their often bitchy attitudes, and inability to understand them through their drunken slurs every five episodes. Do not listen if you are nursing, pregnant, or may become pregnant. Comics, movies, anime, video games, and much, much more with Nerdy Words. Fridays on acepodcastnetwork.com. back to another very insightful episode of Vaguely Accurate. As always, I'm your host DK, and today we meet Anna Shear. Anna is a PhD candidate from Curtin University within the Health Sciences. I hope you enjoy learning from her and about her work as much as I did. Just before we get into the show, I would like to thank everyone who has subscribed and also checked out iTunes and given us a rating and review. It's a big help, and if you haven't, I'd like to ask, please, could you just pop on this Give us a five stars. Takes two seconds and actually really helps us out. But I'm not going to babble on too much today. Let's get straight into it. Cheers, guys. Yeah, so thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. Um, do you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your field as well? Sure. My name's Anna Shia. I'm a physiotherapist by training, but I'm doing research in ex- more exercise physiology. It's sort of a bit of a crossover between physio and exercise physiology, so... My research is in water-based exercise and what that does to blood vessels. So, yeah, a bit of a cross between hydrotherapy versus exercise therapy. We're comparing pool-based exercise to gym-based exercise and no exercise to see what works best for people with heart disease. So before you, we get into the nitty-gritty bits about your research, you say you're a physio and most physios tend to do clinical work. What motivated you to... Did you do any clinical and what motivated you to... Step into research. Back to research. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did do a bit of clinical. In my last year of my studies at uni, I was quite sick and I didn't enjoy a lot of my prac. So I said, no, I'm not going to be a physio. Can't stand this. Hate hospitals. So I got out of it for a bit. I went and did sonography, which is ultrasound imaging. So mm-hmm. I did part of a master's for that and I worked clinically doing that for about eight months and then I decided that there's only so many fatty livers you can see in one day <laughs> quite repetitive. Get out of it. yeah quite repetitive also sort of the same old same old a couple of fun scans like obstetrics but predominantly fatty livers and they are quite physical to do as well and yeah oh, really? just wasn't enjoying it yeah I you got to push quite, quite hard passive as a I suppose a technique yeah you know it's a probe that goes across the surface it depends on someone who's nice and skinny it is sort yeah. of more about getting the right angle whereas a larger person you do have to dig in to see the back of the liver <laughs> and if you're examining fatty livers i can imagine it it's a lot of clientele that you probably more yeah. common at least and the problem is it attenuates the ultrasound beam so it's hard to penetrate the back of the liver so it's mm. a lot of poking and prodding and people don't particularly like being poked and prodded so yeah a lot of stressed out people that you're scanning as well <laughs> i pull a stern face when i'm scanning it's just because i'm concentrating and that'll freak out so <laughs> i'm like i'm just concentrating that what are you seeing why are you so stern just concentrating i get the same face when i read it doesn't yeah. matter what i'm reading apparently i've just got this very concentrated space and yeah. like no matter what it is someone will always look over it's like is it bad news it's yeah just a, it's a book it's like it's not even a message yeah, so then after that, I went back and did some clinical work. So I did home rehab for about two and a half years, and then mm-hmm. I'd saved up enough money that I could get a house with my partner and finally got the house, and then I could afford to go back into research. That's fantastic. Yeah, so we've finally got that. So then I was like, yes, I've got sort of the financial position to be able to go back and be on a student wage again. So mm-hmm. got a scholarship and found my supervisor who I'd worked with previously, told him what I was interested in looking at, and 
we went from there. So did your scholarship come from a government base? Yeah, yeah. it was the Australian Postgraduate Award, but oh, yeah. they're now in the process of changing the scheme as of January 1st. So I'm not quite sure what it was called at the moment, but it's the same sort of thing. So the government okay. and Curtin also contributes partly to it as well. Yeah. Um, what motivated you to become a physio in the first place? I wanted to help people, but I sort of ended up a physio by accident. <laughs> by accident? It's an amazing number of physios that I've heard say that they've ended up there by accident. Yeah. Um, I was all set to go and do global and ocean science at ANU in Canberra. Um, <laughs> all set, got into the college of my choice, did all the interviews, shortlisted for a scholarship, but my grandma was sick and physio is what I put on my Perth form. So oh, okay. I stayed to help out with her, except she died in my first semester, so <laughs> sorry, physio it is. <laughs> <laughs> but then I knew I stayed with it because it, it was interesting to me and I do want to be able to help people as well. And then I had the option of doing honours with physio, so I, that was my motivation. I can go into research that way. So what did you do for your honours? Can you give us a title for it and tell us a little <laughs> yes. bit about your experiences? The effects of water-based exercise and people with type 2 diabetes. So I'm still finishing off part of the project now, six years later, Wow. the write-up. So we had issues recruiting for that study because we had a very strict selection criteria. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a student running a group of people in the pool, you have to have a lot of safety checking and make sure that they're medically well otherwise, no heart yeah. problems, etc. So yeah, so it took us a long time to get the sample. We had enough to graduate me with my honours after the two years that we sort of overload the final two years of your degree with instead of doing a separate year. Yep. So I did that and then gradually as I've been working, we added in a few more people as we went and finishing the final data now. Are you able to tell us uh, what you found? Yes. Um, awesome. <laughs> Some <for> of it. <laughs> We're still doing the final part of the blood flow analysis, but the rest of it we found that strength improved by about 15-20%. Mm -hmm. depending upon the muscle group looked at and fitness improved by about 16%. So and good was, outcomes. Was this in comparison to a more traditional uh, terrain-based exercise? Um, no, we for this study, because of the recruitment <laughs> issues okay. and the fact that it was only an honours study, yeah. it's it sort of beyond the scope of so, an honours study. So we compared to a no exercise control. So just continuing their usual activities for the eight weeks. Okay, so you're it. looking at whether just water-based exercise is effective full yeah, stop pretty much for people it. with type 2. And why type 2 diabetes? Um, I'm sh obviously, the actually, also, do you mind describing type 2 diabetes for anyone who may have sure. a misconception <laughs> about it? Um, type 2 diabetes is generally, it used to be called non-insulin-dependent diabetes, so it traditionally occurs later onset, but now we're finding it happening younger and younger due to lifestyle changes. It has been linked to obesity and sort of eating lots of fatty, sugary, salty foods. Mm -hmm. Um, it's linked a lot with vascular disease, which is why I was interested in it. Um, so the group that I work with, we look at blood vessel health and how blood vessels function. So type 2 diabetes is sort of a good starting point to try and get in some of that preventative work, though quite a lot of type 2 diabetics further down the track from the group that we were looking at do have quite severe vascular complications, so more prone to having loss of sensation in the hands and feet and so that glove and stocking loss and ulcers and all sorts of nasty things to the feet so heart yeah. attacks also more prone to so the glove and stocking syndrome is something I, i've heard about quite a lot is is that way it's not paralysis but that's where you kind of lose sensitivity and control from your limb from the extremities yeah. first to come so that's working your way in. works up so that's why it's like you're putting on gloves and stockings and then sort of travels up yeah from that's the, the uh, proper way it starts distally that's yeah. so <laughs> starts at the fingertips yeah. and toes and works its way up yeah, so um, when you were getting, when you were, what was the reason finding clientele to actually help out so hard? Um, we wanted ones that didn't have any cardiovascular complications and okay. were otherwise generally healthy. Unfortunately, no. quite a lot of people with type 2 diabetes already have some sort of cardiovascular condition, so either a heart condition or that glove and stocking loss or something along those lines. Yeah. So trying to find ones that were healthy enough but still had the disease. Yeah, so... <laughs> Well, from that, obviously, you said there was a few limitations and you can get yeah. the certain controls and stuff like that. But that motivated you and continue, and you continued a similar form of research on into your PhD, right? Yeah. So you're still looking at water-based exercise, but yes. you were changing the, I suppose, the sample group. Yes. So we're looking at coronary heart disease, so people who already have established vascular disease. Yeah. 
and sort of seeing if we can help to improve their blood vessel function. And we're also looking at things like their brain blood flow and fitness strength, all the standard ones, body composition and blood test results. So hopefully we see, we're also running the trial for a longer period. The diabetic group was eight weeks and this group's for 12 weeks. So we're seeing if we start to see more of those sort of longer term changes in body composition with that. So what were you looking for um, out of a few parameters, just a few I'm gonna pick out. Um, Blood, Blood tests, what were you, parameters were you looking at or what attributes were you looking at in their blood to change? Yeah, we're looking to see, I mean, for the eight-week group, we weren't expecting to see much change. It was more to prove that things weren't changing significantly. Sort of sometimes you can see a little bit of a change with them, so the lipid profile, so the cholesterol levels and the types of good and bad cholesterol, if they're improving or getting worse. Mm -hmm. We also looked at the diabetics at blood sugar levels, but... We're not doing that for this group. So we're just looking at sort of some of the inflammation markers, the cholesterol markers. We also do a bit of a screen on like their liver health and yeah. all of that before we put them in the pool. And then you've got the the other one I was interested in is brain blood flow. Yeah. Were you one, how were you measuring that? And also were you looking at that as a correlation to cognitive function or performance in terms of their daily lives and their yeah. memory capacity maybe? Sort of. The problem is we've got a smallish sample so if you want to look at cognitive effects you really need a very large sample to be able to show change in that so we are looking at a little bit of cognitive function but we're not sure that we've got the sample size to see a big change in that the brain blood flow we measure with a special type of ultrasound called transcranial doppler so it's basically little probes that stick on the side of your head you wear a fun little helmet thing (laughs) that sort of looks like the minor lights and we tighten that one up You've got to look at a screen, unlike normal ultrasound that most people are familiar with where you see sort of an image on the screen of what's inside. Mm. With this one, you only see a velocity trace and if it's coming towards you or away from you. Yeah. So it takes a bit of training and practice, which I do at work, to try and find the right vessels that we're looking for and make sure they're at the right depth. They're giving the sort of velocity you would expect and the pattern you'd expect to see with the other vessels either side. Yeah, so that's a te- yeah. that's a speciality of ultrasound, isn't it? Yeah. It's like a form, yeah, a it's technique not, in vascular ultrasound or something like that. It's not normally a clinical thing. They sometimes do it on the wards okay. for stroke patients to see if there's a blockage, but um, it's more of a research thing that we're using it for. It's rather than a clinical technique. Like I've never seen it done clinically at the practice I was at. Yeah. Um, nor the other va- nor the other ultrasound techniques we use aren't usually used clinically in Australia. So we use them more for research purposes they're still sort of being developed for clinical use here. So this one, it is used clinically in some circumstances, but not so much for what we're doing. We're looking for change over time. So this is sort of more of a research application at the moment. Yeah. But yeah, they've done quite a lot in overseas sort of on this technique. So it's been done. It's just not necessarily a clinical test per se. Yeah. So it hasn't, doesn't, I suppose clinicians can't really find a yeah. practical application that will really change their, yeah. I suppose, routine or whatever they have scheduled for their patient yeah. from that. Not just yet. Yeah. It's a bit sort of specialized in terms of it takes a lot of training to do the technique. Before yeah. Now I'm going to let you loose a little bit here. <laughs> um, do you mind telling us and giving us an overview of the methodology and the approach you took to do your PhD project, what you were looking at, what control groups you had and why you chose what you did. Yeah, Um, I'm interested in heart disease. So that was, and vascular problems. So that was why I chose the population that I did. My dad's actually got, had a bypass surgery. So I was Mm -hmm. really interested in finding ways to sort of help improve the outcomes for people with heart disease and their, obviously the brain function and how their body works and ensuring that they're going and improving their health going forwards. There's a big problem in Australia where quite a lot of people who have a heart attack either don't do the rehab or don't have it offered to them initially. Um, And then in those that do, less than half are still active one year after they've had a heart attack. So this is quite a small percentage that are actually doing the right thing and getting all the regular exercise, which the guidelines and evidence say is the best thing for it. Mm -hmm. So not many people are exercising and we're sort of looking at reasons why they're not. And then quite a lot, about 60% of people with heart disease or coronary heart disease, Not I'm not looking at heart failure patients, just coronary artery disease. Yeah. Um, so Is that clogged up arteries yeah, and just kind of bad diet deposits, choices? And- lifestyle and yeah, predominantly through that. And um, they are potentially investigating some genetic factors with it as well. But yeah, it's predominantly, I mean, it starts in children and 
sort of it progresses your whole lifespan and gradually sort of the fatty bits in the artery get bigger mm-hmm. they can rupture and the little bit that breaks off can wedge further downstream and cause a heart attack so yeah. it's a pretty serious problem that, we've all seen that video you get shown in high school is yep. just the artery and it's just like <laughs> boop, and you get yeah. stuck again a bit further so we're trying to avoid it <laughs> yeah of course so they've actually found in some studies overseas not sure how they got ethics through <laughs> but they compared stenting which is sort of putting like a scaffold in the artery where this big fatty deposit is they've compared that to exercise over a year and looked at the outcomes okay yeah no. so <laughs> a scaffolding around the inside or the, the outside so they inflate pretty- a little balloon up with a scaffold around it and then yeah. sort of inflate that over the plaque it's called a stent or most people call it a stent mm. so just to get it going again yeah then- it opens it up and then allows the blood to flow back through a bit more freely so Oh, okay, so this blockage may still remain, but just it's sort of squashed, kind of... <laughs> squashed out, so that the blood flow goes back through. That's really so bizarre. That happens to a lot of people after a heart attack. They'll do an angiogram and they go inside the blood vessels in the heart and have a look at where the problem is. And yeah, then, yeah. So they, if they see one that's blocked up and it's appropriate to do this, they'll do that. Otherwise, if there's a lot of blockages, sometimes they look at a bypass surgery, which is using part of a vein in your leg or an artery in your chest to sort mm-hmm. of go over the bits that are not working properly and God, sort of go around it. skill to take a vein out from your leg and yeah. stick it where your <laughs> arteries are. You get some pretty neat scars with it too. <laughs> oh, really? Down the legs, a nice little white line. But oh, yeah, that's what it heals up quite well most of the time. So, yeah. yeah. So that's a bit of a segue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where were we? Oh, you so were just, just, yeah, yeah you were so discussing. comparing the stent to just exercise in, Ge- I think it was Germany, judging by the names of the authors. Um, they actually found that exercise for 12 months, sort of a moderate intensity on a cycle device, it wasn't quite a bike, it was sort of like a recumbent cycling thing. Mm-hmm. They actually found that more there was a better outcome in terms of mortality in the people that were doing the exercise compared to the people that were having the stents. And they found that exercise helped to stabilize those little fatty deposits, mm-hmm. whereas the stent sort of squished it back, but then it can regrow. Okay. And then the problem is putting a stent in only fixes that one artery and obviously there are many arteries and you can have problems elsewhere. Yeah. So, yeah, there's sort of evidence to suggest that exercise can help to improve heart health and blood vessel health as well as your general factors such as your fitness and strength which affect your function. So I thought it would be a good idea to look at exercise and different types of exercise to sort of see what we can do to get people exercising again. So yeah. because so many people with heart disease have arthritis or they're overweight quite a lot find land-based so gym-based exercise or walking uncomfortable or painful (laughs) so then yeah so if they find it painful or uncomfortable they're less likely to do it regularly and if we get them exercising in the pool that might help to make it more comfortable for them because you take some of the weight off the joints yeah and hopefully that encourage them to do more regular exercise so pretty much changing the exercise itself Mm. to a low impact from a high impact exercise hoping just the, the lack of pain and the, it might make them feel a bit more motivated to go out and do it yeah. and just not kind of that mindset of oh it just hurts so much why do I have to kind yeah of thing. and it's something different as well sometimes people get bored with what they're doing and then they stop doing yeah. it's like, oh, same thing every time so at least doing something different might help to add something to their routine and yeah. get a few more engaged that way the other thing is is it changes the way that blood vessels function a little bit being in the water so when you're in the water the pressure of the water on the legs pushes more blood back up to the heart and then this causes some more blood to come back out of the heart and that might change some of the stimulus on the blood vessels and that sort of changes how they function a little bit so that's the other thing we're interested in investigating if that has an added benefit on blood vessel health that's really really fascinating yeah so you were, when you when you were doing this and you were looking obviously at the three group well you made three groups i remember yeah. you telling me before so you had a control which were doing no exercise so just their usual activities so some okay. of the people coming into the program are already doing sort of like light walking occasionally or sort of a one-off session a week yeah so and, then, and then you had a control doing terrestrial based exercise yep so in the gym and then they're doing circuit training so alternating strength and fitness exercises which yep. is similar to some research our group has done in the past and found to have both the benefits of fitness training and strength training which is bonus like yeah. especially if you're someone who's 
I suppose not as motivated as someone else who's willing to dedicate whole yep. sessions to X, yeah. Y, and Z. Two for the price of one. <laughs> exactly. And then you've got your water-based fitness yeah. training. So it's upright exercise and we've matched the exercises that they do in the pool to what they're doing in the gym. Yeah. So that they're doing the same muscle groups and the same type of exercise oh, cool. and the same timing of the circuits. So yeah. yeah, it should be pretty well matched. And we've been trying to quantify the resistance of how they're working in the pool and how that's would you quantify the resistance of what they've got going on? That's interesting. Engineering feat. <laughs> um, basically, we started this project with a very low budget. So we, well, we came up with an idea to quantify the resistance by sort of using some, first of all, by using calculations. So I've been working with a physics team and we've got a set of calculations using the person's mass and we've got, we've made these paddles. Mm -hmm. So they go either side of the leg or the hand, depending upon what exercise they're doing and sort of sandwich it in. And then when they move in the water, that adds some drag and the drag resistance is what we're using to create the training stimulus. So it's pretty much a pressure sensor almost. Though, um, no, them. not that sophisticated. It's perspex and um, some, <laughs> the, what is it? Perspex and some sort of seatbelt strapping to kind of hold them <laughs> off. And how was that giving a quantified result? Um, so then to do that, we've been, I've been filming people underwater. Yeah. So we've attached a spring to the back of the paddles and watching the passive recoil. So they stretch it out to maximum and let it come back yeah and doing that with no paddle a small paddle and a large paddle so we've made a tripod out of a selfie stick duct tape and a bucket so that's sort of the level of our budget was sitting at the skills of a phc <laughs> i've heard some amazing kind of uh, do it yourself yep. stories and we've them. currently had a plate weight holding up a shower rod with the measuring devices <laughs> on it <laughs> and some springs of about 50 different types so i know a lot about the bunning, bunning spring sections yep yep <laughs> kmart's been very helpful for providing plate weights so yeah and we've also calibrated the spring as well by att attaching different weights and seeing how far the string spring stretches so that we can compare that to the video footage and we're using matlab to do the comparison okay i can see so. how you work and so you're you're getting your uh, i suppose standard parameters from the spring extension that you're yeah. using yourself and getting, getting direct measurements from that and then you're using the video to assess the, i suppose the uh Velocity deformation and length and yeah. tension in the spring and then you're kind of using that and to speed. assess and we're also filming it moving at different speeds and using the calculations to see how close we're getting with how them. close did you get still analyzing that data still, okay i won't ask too much more <laughs> in, in progress it's, it's still an impressive way to do it it's like it's a bit outside of my normal field it's a bit more physics based so it's been yeah. sort of going back to the books and finding what all of the right equations and remembering how to do all of the maths behind it all and yeah yeah I've been lucky that Curtin actually has a fluid dynamics research team. So one of the researchers there has been kind enough to help me, That's nice. <laughs> which has been lovely because, <laughs> yeah. yeah, obviously his calculations are a lot more sophisticated than my ones. So yeah. we're hoping that by doing that, we've got a water-based met waterproof metronome, I should say, and it makes a beep and you can set the speed so that we know how far a person moves when they do an exercise. We know how big their limb is. We know how big the paddle is yeah. and we know the speed they're working at. So from that, we can hopefully quantify the resistance with calculations so it was a form of like aqua aerobics that you sort were of, doing yeah yeah it, so it's just these paddles providing the resistance so they do say like a knee straightening and bending one so mm -hmm. that sort of works on the quads and the hamstrings and we can sort of work out given how fast they're working and what size paddle they're using at the time how much equivalent weight in kilograms they're doing to that and we can compare that to the gym group so with, in theory <laughs> in theory like um it's you, physios themselves like clinicians use i believe it's called a hydro pool quite yes, often like yeah. they use that for certain patients with x conditions yeah. or other reasons um would the, is this a technique that's already invoked in hydro pools not really see it's more that's where it's sort of more of an exercise physiology thing so okay. most of the ones that we take through sort of a hydro pool are sort of a hip and knee replacements or a neurological condition so they've had a stroke or something like that and we're retraining how they need to move and yeah. improving their movement ability or getting the knee moving, say if it's a knee replacement, building up the strength and getting the walking pattern happening more normally. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a pretty big surgery and it takes a while to <laughs> get everything perfected and back to normal. So I've used it clinically in that sense in terms of a sort of set of targeted exercises to improve a specific problem, whereas yep. this is sort of more of a general exercise program to improve their overall strength, function and health. Yeah, okay. So it's sort of that's where kind of the crossover is, so... And before, kind of we, yeah. before we go into the results of what you're finding out, yep. um, I want to know, what was your sample size? Because I've been having been, this would be a bit of a segue, but I've been having discussions with several physios now and or health professionals and 
research health when you look at the papers themselves they statistically they look quite poor in quality because mm. getting a large enough sample su- sample size to be statistically relevant as in comparison to other stuff like yeah. other based sciences um it's hard like yeah. <laughs> yesterday i had someone on the show who had seven people as her phd kind of sample group and two of them dropped out yeah. like and it's I get that if it shows results within five people, it might improve some, another five people somewhere else. Yeah. But yeah, it's just an interest. It's, it's very, very different and very interesting to see how the research research community accepts like a, a sample size of eight people. Yeah. In comparison to oh, in this biology unit, you need a sample size of twenty thousand units or something yeah. like that. It's just a bit. I can understand twenty thousand would be time consuming yeah. and impractical Money. and making people but yeah. <laughs> Funding is sort of one of the limiting factors in a lot of health research. Obviously doing all the tests and getting access to the clinicians and the training venues is quite expensive. Yeah. So um yeah, we do have that thing of you want a sample that's big enough to prove your effect but not so big that it's bleeding you dry really financially. So um, our sample size, we're aiming to get 20 per group. We've got the three groups, so 60 participants total, which okay, means each person has really three good. testing sessions before, three testing sessions after. That's actually really, as far as I'm aware, I think that's quite a reasonable Should value be, for hopefully. a health-based field, isn't it? I mean, quite a lot of the training studies sort of have that sort of sample size. I mean, my diabetics, by the end of sort of five years of pulling hen's teeth, <laughs> we ended up with 13 <laughs> in each group. So... Yeah, and that was with a lot of effort and going back and re-recruiting and getting more for the control group. We had issues with the control group not turning up for assessments. It's a skill I can imagine you learn very, very quickly on, I'm not going to call it networking, but just staying in contact and that interpersonal skill of, come on, it's time. (laughs) Like, I know you don't want to, but please, just you promised. Yeah, and kind of when to cut your losses. Like, if they keep DNAing or not attending appointments, it can be quite costly and time consuming because you've got someone booked set up ready to do the session with them and then yeah. you've still got to obviously cover that and then if they don't turn up repeatedly you've got to go well i don't think they're going to show up if we give them a fourth <laughs> session and we've given them three goes and they still haven't turned up we think they're not going to come back it's so. free exercise come down yeah oh the exercise groups have all been fantastic it's the control group we had trouble with last time so all oh, they have to do is show up down. show up to a testing session after the program and yeah, yeah that was the hard part I know funding is an issue, but that's where you need like an incentive of just yeah. like, um, I was going to say a free Subway cookie, but then that's probably <laughs> not, not, the best for for, <laughs> not the best for diabetic group, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, we did actually offer them a free exercise program at the end of the study, but yeah, yeah. they well, weren't super keen. That wasn't a randomized study, so they selected themselves into groups because we had issues with sample size and I only had a limited time to do my honours in. So yeah. but for those reasons, it ended up being that it wasn't randomized, but it was controlled still, so... Yeah. The other factor for I suppose health based research is isolation of parameters. That mm-hmm. you everyone is unique and no one is a closed system. So you've yeah. got all these clients and all these pe- um, samples coming in. Uh, however you refer to them, sorry. And <laughs> participants. Uh, participants. Thank you. That is the word I'm looking for. So you've got these people coming in that all have this one condition in common: this coronary heart disease. And you, yes, you need them to be healthy and not going to drop dead on you during an exercise. Yeah. However, how do you, um, best way to word this, how do you take into account other conditions that these people are likely to have, especially if they've got coronary heart disease, it's usually associated with other conditions that they've got. It's not just nice yeah. that, oh, you have this one condition. So you've probably got a patient with coronary heart disease and this, and then you've yeah. got another one with coronary heart disease and that. How do you... I, when you get your results, how do you determine that the results are co- correlated to the heart disease as yeah. opposed to the other conditions? Um, in terms of what we're looking at, we're quite strict with our recruitment criteria to avoid some of that noise. So okay. we're not taking people with certain other conditions. So again, we've got that list that we go through. Okay, if they've got this problem, they're not eligible. But if it's something like arthritis, and actually, yeah, that's okay. We want to see if they do do the exercise. Yeah. So we sort of have some control that way. But yeah, it's a lot of medical record screening on my part, <laughs> getting through a long list at the hospital and it's slowly getting there. But yeah, yeah it's hard trying to sort of, yeah, <laughs> hard to try and get the sample that you want so that it hasn't got a lot of noise. But then obviously there's sort of issues in terms of translating that to other populations or people with X disease and Y other disease. So yeah. 
yeah, there is that in terms of it may not necessarily be transferable to everybody, but it's a good starting point Mm -hmm. sort of to get the basic data in a relatively healthy bunch of people with heart disease to sort of as a starting point to sort of that's an oxymoron in itself isn't it i know but (laughs) sort of relatively healthy so they don't have a huge amount of other comorbidities that could sort of influence your results so it's a good starting point to say okay so for a basic population if it's just a straightforward thing like a stent and no other complications which happens with a lot of the younger ones then yeah okay this might be appropriate here and we can look at further research in this group there yeah whereas obviously people with other conditions you have to be a bit more careful with safety wise so for example heart failure patients um, because you do increase the blood flow back to the heart you do have to be a little bit careful in some studies they have found obviously the ones with heart failure are very small sample sizes but I think one study found one person had a slight arrhythmia when they were submerged past a certain depth of heart failure. So, oh, really? Yeah, because when they get increases to a certain depth. Flow. Yeah, so we're limiting our depth to sort of the bottom of the chest, which mm-hmm. has been proven safe in the literature, even in people with heart failure. Therefore, okay. in people without it should be fine. Is it just the external pressure around um, the body? Basically, yeah, the pressure on the legs causes more blood back into the heart, and that increases sort of some of the blood going back around the body. So. I would know that... W- I always thought that would be as almost negligible pressure. I mean, you feel it, I suppose, but yeah. in terms of the heart rate increasing. It increases right? the blood back to the chest by about, or cardiac output, by up to sort of 60% in some people. Wow. So it's a big that is, That's a significant, especially with someone that's heart who's not working yeah. at optimal capacity, I suppose. Yeah. that's So, yeah, it depends on how deep you submerge. There's a whole bunch of different factors that affect that sort of the person's health, how deep you submerge them, how warm the water is and all yeah. sorts of things. So there's a huge range of being like sort of a 5% through to that sort of higher end there. So That's like one of those things that I definitely take for granted, being able to just jump yeah. into a pool. <laughs> that's it. But it turns out not everyone can do that. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's why we're doing the upright thing so we want to see if the extra blood sort of coming back from the increased cardiac output stimulates the blood vessels more and improves their health faster but yeah yeah so and it also improves blood flow to the brain so there have been studies in healthy people Mm -hmm. um where they stick them in the pool and exercise them at a low intensity and watch the increase in blood flow to the brain obviously when you exercise you do get more blood flow to the brain anyway yeah but exercising in the pool increases it more than exercising on land so we're doing an acute study in people with coronary heart disease Mm -hmm. assuming all plans go smoothly this year that we'll be doing that later in the year and looking at the effects of different intensities of exercise on land and in a tank that we've got at the uni and filling it up with water (laughs) as far as like i know like i do a lot of land-based exercise i go into the pool i'm useless i do two (laughs) lengths and i'm tired and i can go for hours on land it's yeah it's a very different environment, so I can imagine for people with um, conditions that do restrict their exercise routine yeah. or ability as it is, it almost being more strenuous to yeah. a point. And so if it can maximise sort of the benefits they do get from their exercise time, then that's great. So yeah. if they can get the same benefits but in a shorter time or a shorter sessions, but obviously that's for further research down the track. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, but no swimming in this program, any upright <laughs> exercise, because swimming <laughs> changes it all again completely, so, so it's interesting. I'd like to ask now, um, let's go to the good juicy bit. What did you find or what have you found thus far? I suppose we should still fit in the process of doing it. still recruiting. still recruiting, okay. We have found recruitment. (laughs) That's Um, reasonable. Do you you have a hypothesis? Do you have an estimation of what you might find? I think looking at the diabetics, I think it'll be similar in that it'll improve strength and fitness and probably the other outcomes in a similar way to the gym program will. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm hoping that the blood vessel function will sort of improve more than the land based group but we yeah. don't know because it hasn't been looked at yet so yeah. when you finally get around to actually getting yeah. the cohort to do what you want it to do I'll be fantastic and um, it'll be fantastic to get the results from yeah. you and put them up on the site when your uh, show comes up as well yeah that'd be cool um, we've certainly yeah the blood vessel stuff's quite interesting we use the technique using ultrasound on an artery in the arm so we look at that for a base we take a baseline picture for a minute and mm-hmm. hopefully it all looks nice and smooth and we can get a good image yeah then we inflate a blood pressure cuff on the forearm mm-hmm. to above your blood pressure so the hand goes all numb and tingly yep that good keep, feeling yeah <laughs> we keep that up for five minutes usually it's numb by the end of that for five minutes five minutes is oh. a stimulus so we're quite nasty not as bad as when we do it on the leg which we do for some studies Brutal. that's a nasty one <laughs> i've had that done get to dead me. leg that grandpa leg feeling it's worse it hurts and then it goes dead <laughs> no wonder you're finding it hard to get participants we're not doing that one i'm a nice person <laughs> i'm only doing the arm um so we leave that up for five minutes so that causes the vessels downstream to dilate 
yep. then we let the cuff go down and then we keep imaging the artery up in the upper arm mm-hmm. and we see how much increase in blood flow there is and we also look at how much the diameter of the vessel changes so we've got special software that reads how big the vessel diameter is yep and we use comparison of the before baseline picture and the after pictures to find sort of the maximum dilation and then that sort of percentage is an indication of how well the artery functions yep so people with heart disease that generally doesn't function as well as a healthy person Mm-hmm. Same as people with type 2 diabetes, they found that's generally impaired compared to normal people. So we're seeing if the exercise training helps to improve that. Now, this might be a very silly question, especially as for all the discussion we just had, but um, what would be the application if, let's say, the water exercise, as your hypothesis says, is better than the land based yeah. for your con- reasons? Um, what would be the application or implications of your research? I mean, the hope is even if it just proves to be equivalent, that we can provide another option that has some evidence behind it for people with heart disease to actually get back into exercise and try yeah. and get those people that sort of drop off the wagon in terms of everyone's usually good for the first few months, does their walking, et cetera, and then sort of people, things get busy, life happens, yeah. exercise gets thrown out the window. And it shouldn't. Then, no, yeah. it shouldn't, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody finds that when things get busy at work or whatever that it'd be one of the first to drop off yeah lower priority so hopefully nice healthy vegetable based diet drops off as well and it becomes the quick frozen food and then that's it it starts deteriorating (laughs) like that that's it so yeah people are normally pretty good at the start and then sort of things kind of drop off after a while we're trying to get those people back into doing some exercise and sort of get them back into a program even if it is just sort of while they sort of get back into it and then compare like do a bit of land based sort of get a bit more variety in their workouts as well and this will be a form of exercise like you said it's resistant base with like um floats and stuff Uh it would yeah no floats. No just, floats. Just, just the drag resistance just the drag paddles. paddles. Sorry, I assume there would be That's like right. floaty paddles, like the ones yeah, you usually no. use so in the pool. We've designed them so that hopefully they shouldn't float much, so that their okay. buoyancy is relatively neutral, so it's just the drag resistance you get, ah, so that we can calculate okay. it. So with this, are, there, mm. are these going to be exercise routines that patients or people themselves are going to be able to implement into their routine on their own? Yeah. Or are they going to have to come to a physiotherapist, hydro pool and get... Yeah. Uh, monitored while they're doing it certainly wouldn't be i mean certainly it depends on medical screening obviously if they're high risk then i wouldn't say just go out into a pool and <laughs> do your own thing give it a crack yeah <laughs> i'd certainly say once you've been cleared by your doctor and all of that and yeah of course yeah then it's sort of a program that i found with the people with diabetes a whole bunch of them kept training with me for the whole year so mm-hmm. it was an eight-week program but the ones at the start of the year kept going for the whole year and they liked it and they kept back and doing it whereas they said they wouldn't go walking so that was good from that point of view that it is well received. Yeah. The other thing is a whole group of them actually made their own paddles. I mean, really, we're only using the paddles so that we can quantify how hard they're working. Yeah. Like, if you're doing your own program, it doesn't necessarily have to be with the paddles. It's just something to provide resistance. So, as you said, floats can work. So, going against Yeah. sort of the pull of the buoyancy. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, they all ran their own program afterwards. I mean, some of them were very industrious and made their own sets of paddles, so <laughs> great for them, but good to hear that they're all still doing the exercise and some of them still go to the pool. No, that's good, because I can imagine if it, was a, if it was a facility only available when you're with a physio, especially in a hydro yeah. pool, which takes more time and yeah. uh, effort from both the physio and, and the patient. And it's more costly too. It's more costly, pool. and people aren't going to stick to a routine such as that. Yeah. Um, and like I think I worked out the, I've recently come to the conclusion of how physios work and they have a client <laughs> and then they have an issue with the client and they get the best they can do is get a list of troubleshoot options and they're like we'll work through this list until yeah. something works yeah. so I can, I'm glad to hear Just that sort of it's something they option. can implement out there right? yeah hopefully I mean obviously once we get some evidence behind it and say that look it is effective or it isn't effective so hopefully it will be effective yeah and, and then yeah I usually ask about limitations. However, I think we've covered quite a few of the limitations in yours, <laughs> apart from your very uh, stringent budget and funding. We've got a good budget now. We've we actually have budget. funding. Oh, yeah. fantastic. So after we did that part of the experiment, we actually got a grant, so a couple of grants. So Oh, fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So, so funding's even off the list of limitations. We can afford the blood tests now, yeah. which is great. <laughs> you could buy your own tripod. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and just add weights. That's it. Um, Bunnings, here you come. I know. Yeah, Bunnings. <laughs> has had a lot of business and <laughs> yeah. um so obviously uh, the other limitations are with as with any health study are it 
restricting the conditions that each patient has like you try your best for it but obviously you can't isolate the everything yeah and you need it to be applicable to the real world too so in the real world you're not going to get someone who's a perfect patient every time no as much as we would like and then you've got and then you've got patient (laughs) dropout rates and stuff like that and commitment levels from those guys so i suppose they're the most uh that was obvious limitations yeah. unless i've missed anything um i guess sort of we had a bit of a delay with all of the paperwork it obviously takes a while to go through the hospital system so okay. now we're finally at the actual recruitment point <laughs> so it's exciting to finally be there um so i'd like to ask now uh well what you how far are you through your phd sorry <laughs> good question <laughs> how far am i meant to be through or how far am i actually through a bit of both yeah um i'm approaching two years in in about a month's time so mm-hmm. meant to be sort of two-thirds of the way through by the time allowance that gets given um at, realistically i won't be finished training people till the end of the year at best and then obviously have to write it up so i think finishing by february the year, next year will be optimistic um <laughs> i'm hoping to be able to get an extension on that but yeah I mean, if you've had to wait for ethics and stuff like that, that yeah. also it gives you right in to government. ask for expansion and government grants and stuff like that. So hopefully, <laughs> I mean, yeah, theoretically, sort of two thirds, but yeah, actually, practically, still got a fair bit of work to go ahead. But yeah. it's getting there, and hopefully, adding the acute study, and we can knock that off fairly quickly. Doing the people in this, we've got this tank under the. It's in a room where I work. It's sort of a tank under the floor. Yeah. That hasn't actually been tested yet. It got put in for another researcher and then they left. So oh. get some use out of it. There's <laughs> conveniently a pool next door to it. So we can hopefully get water in and out that way. And you mentioned workload. You're quite a busy person. Like yeah. you sent me a short summary of what you do. <laughs> and I've spoken to you before. And you tend, you're, you, not only are you doing your PhD, you're doing research at two other facilities or is it three <laughs> <laughs> my research is sort of i'm collaborating with i'm from Curtin. we collaborate with uwa and also fiona stanley and royal perth hospitals yep. so this research is sort of in four has to do with four institutions um where i work i work for a different unit i work for one of the universities and help out with a couple of projects there and i help out with a couple of the Curtin projects just sort of bits and pieces here and there yeah. But then hopefully people will help me back. So Yeah, it's kind of, I suppose, time, time is what you can give right now. So to get, instead of getting like hiring people to help you out, yeah. you give a little, you hope they give a little back. That's it. And yeah. everyone seems to. So at the moment I've been progressing all of my skills in sort of the brain blood flow thing I was saying earlier and the yeah. ultrasound skills. So sort of we all work together. I teach someone some skill, they'll teach me another skill. So yeah. So we'll work together, get through it together. <laughs> without going too much detail into each project, are you doing anything really interesting in those fields? I'm sure it's all interesting, yeah. but anything that really resonates with yourself? Yeah. The study I work on is a really cool one. So that's looking at the effects of sitting down all day versus breaking up the sitting down. So sort of getting up and walking every half hour and what it does to the brain and how the brain that's functions. That's fascinating. Like doing computer tests sporadically through the day. So seeing how their cognitive function's going. Yeah. We also do the ultrasound test on the arm before and after the day and we we're sort of looking at one day they sit down for the entire day eight hours which is quite a long time when you have to do it it's a long time yeah. to sit down it's bad <laughs> that's the long day that they find long whereas the other days we as researchers we find longer where they're up and walking because we have to obviously run around and get everything set up because they're all hooked up with a whole bunch of equipment so we have to yeah. get that safely on and off the treadmill <laughs> which is a fun fun project yeah. um yeah so comparing half an hour of exercise in the morning to sitting down for the rest of the day and then half an hour of exercise in the morning to getting up every half hour for just a short walk that's really see. have you got yeah. any preliminary results coming from that not yet that's actually that's a shame i'm yeah. i'm excited to learn about that because i fidget a lot like yeah. i can't i can't sit down my friends in even at my workplace i made a stand-up desk out of some cardboard boxes yeah and my tv my screen was up like you know by my face but it was kind of wonky because the yeah. box started bending <laughs> and they were just like how is that effective it's like if i sit down i just fidget and can't i don't know yeah so I'm always interested. Yeah, to that's know that. a collaboration with Melbourne as well. So um, there's a PhD student who's from UWA, but he's based in Melbourne. So he's running that side of it there. So I'm sort of helping out with his projects. How far through are they with that? Uh, the Melbourne site's almost finished Ooh. their recruitment. Oh. I think they've got another few. <laughs> oh, we do. That's recruitment and going. So okay. we, they've been running for a bit longer than us we started up here later so we've got the rest of this year to go i think we've got about 15 through already at our site but it takes three weeks to get a person through 
Oh, wow. Of like they do one session a week for three weeks. Yeah. So. I'm really interested to find yeah. out the results from that. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. Please do. Yeah, the, um, the guy who's projected is he actually won the three-minute thesis competition at UWA on it. So oh, that was fantastic. really cool. So. That's, yeah. that's I only Lots recently heard about the, I only recently <laughs> heard about the three minute thesis. I'm hoping to go next time and I'm speaking to people at the moment that I'll be able to record yeah. all the three minute thesis and just make an episode about it. And so it, it. That, that way it can reach a few more Some people. Some of them are on YouTube if you dig. I don't think yeah. They recorded all of ours, so Yeah. They're somewhere. <laughs> they're somewhere. <laughs> they're somewhere. Hopefully deep buried. <laughs> Is there any other fantastic research that was out there? Yeah, there's some really cool ones that we're doing. My friend's one actually got on the news the other day. So Ooh. she's looking at testosterone and exercise. So um, looking at training in the gym with a testosterone supplement or not. They don't know who's on the cream and who's not on the placebo. So mm-hmm. or who's on the placebo, who's on the cream. Yeah. And versus cream. No, yeah, so they do testosterone cream on the, to the abdomen. Okay. So somewhere on the tummy where there's not much hair, they rub a cream in every day. Yeah. No one knows what it is except for the person who allocates it. Yeah. So we don't know what it is when they come in to see us, which is good. Um, yeah, versus doing the exercise with or without the cream versus doing no exercise with or without the cream and sort of seeing what the effects are. So that's one that's up and running. That's really cool. Yeah, there's some that's... really, really interesting exercise physiology studies yeah. going on. And there's another really cool one that I'm helping out with. Oh, there's two at Curtin that I sort of help out with from my group we've all got the same supervisor so those who are uwa ones this one's from Curtin. um they're looking at the effects of a left ventricular assist device so an artificial heart pump yep um for people with really advanced heart failure sort of on the wait list for a transplant mm-hmm. so for the, yeah for that one where they're looking at the different types of exercise intensity and what that does to the blood vessels and the brain function and how the brain blood flow goes with exercise so that's a really cool project. That's really cool. That's very hard to get a sample size for, obviously, because yep. there's a very, very limited number of potential participants for that. So, yeah, that's one of the ones where to, in order to get an improved sample size for that, that we're actually adding in sites in Melbourne and Sydney so to oh, try okay. and get the a larger sample because in Perth, I think we've got three fourths of, through a couple so far and then obviously you lose people if they get transplanted. So. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that makes sense. it's a tricky one. <laughs> um, before and we finish time. off, I usually like to ask if you have anything you would a message, a take home message for any of the audience, uh, whether it would be something they can implement in their lives or a cause or you'd like to advocate for. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to share with them? Certainly, I think just keeping a good balanced lifestyle is a really good thing and not forgetting to get out there and get moving obviously as the workload picks up coming back into the main part of the year to actually get out there and keep exercising and it does a world of good for your body and yeah keep going with the little things not letting them drop off <laughs> and it gets keeps the uh pain, little pains and aches that you get as you get older yeah, out of bay i stopped it. exercising for like th- four days over new year and i felt things coming on and i was yeah. like I'm, I'm 24 <laughs> this shouldn't be happening yeah it's good I've been yeah I have to get back into it myself but it's been <laughs> nice to have a break sometimes but yeah, oh, it's course. good to keep keep going and keep moving yeah. good for your blood vessels and everything else that's going on and we're looking to see yeah what, with other projects sort of what the effects are on the brain and cognition and there's a whole bunch of cool things going on out there so yeah. keep your eyes out and be a research participant if you can yeah help out your local <laughs> universities and research organizations with just a little bit of your time and it goes a long way and you're always looking for people (laughs) and you know the people appreciate it it's not just like oh thanks for coming goodbye they're they're, they may do that but they appreciate the time and effort you put into helping them yeah and there's projects that suit all different people with all different conditions even healthy people so oh i find projects out i'm happy to help out if people (laughs) need it like keep me in mind if you heal anyone that needs someone but i don't have any type of diabetes oh perfect (laughs) chuck it on does it involve swimming no. Okay, cool, because I'm useless at swimming. I can do it, but I'm useless. Yeah. Anyway. I've had quite a few that aren't keen on swimming for my ones. It's like, it's okay, no swimming involved. You're only going to your chest. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you for having me. And that's it from us today. Thank you very much for joining us. As I said that before, uh, if you could pop on iTunes and just give us a five-star rating, that really helps us out. It's really appreciated. And always check out Ace Podcast Network for new fantastic shows and even updates on your old classics. There's something there for everyone and you will find something that is definitely your cup of tea. But thank you very much guys and I hope you all have a fantastic day. Take care.